but it really frustrates me that we don't have a biomarker for this. Yeah, or or aging in general. Yeah, or for I mean, aging in general. So let, let's talk yeah. a little bit about that. So what is what does that look like? I mean, when I had Eileen White on the podcast, uh, gosh, it's been whew, maybe a year and a half now. We had a really interesting discussion about why we don't even have biomarkers for autophagy. I mean, something that is so important, and yeah. we can't measure it. And this was important in the context of people who choose to calorically restrict or fast. Um, right. You know. Is fasting for a day long enough to generate a meaningful amount of autophagy in a human? In a mouse, it clearly is, but in a human, is it? No idea. Is right. two days, three days, seven days? You know, seven days is almost assuredly enough. It's a big difference between fasting for a day and fasting for seven days. Yeah. Why don't we have biomarkers for that? Why don't we have a biomarker that can assess nutrient sensing better? Why don't we have a, you know, I mean, you could argue we have some biomarkers. We can measure telomere length, but you know, you know my feelings on this, Matt. I'm in the camp that thinks measuring telomere length is not helpful at all for aging. And I think there's plenty of data to suggest that while telomere length is a very important marker of cellular division, it really speaks very little about the, orga the organism's state of aging, um, despite the popularity of that, that biomarker. Right. Um, even the epigenetic clocks I don't find to be helpful. I find them to be far too, and I'd like you to push back on this if, if you feel as much, um, but I, I've seen how easily they can be manipulated by short-term interventions that don't seem biologically relevant. Yeah. So I, I think I'll start with the epigenetic clock because everybody, that, that's a big, yeah, you know, let's, let's explain uh, to people what that is. Let's, let's, field, let's start but... from the beginning. Assume people don't know what an epigenetic clock is. Right. So, so the epigenetic clock refers to um, typically chemical marks on DNA that regulate uh, gene expression, whether or not, you know, the gene that is located at specific points in your genome gets turned on or, or off. And what has been observed is that those marks change with age in pretty much every organism where it's been studied and that you can identify patterns of change at specific locations in the genome. So specific changes in these chemical marks with age that correlate very uh, strongly with chronological age. And, and so that has led to the idea that you can create clocks that look at specific changes in chemical marks in the, the DNA, the genome, that are um, telling you something about how long that, that organism has been alive. Um, and then what sort of has emerged from that is that there may be, you've, there are two things that have emerged from that. One is you may be able to use that chronological aging clock to find individuals whose marks don't fall on the line that you would expect it to fall on based on their chronological age. In other words, you know, they have marks that make them look older or younger than their chronological age says that they are. And so you might, you would hypothesize that those individuals biologically, if those marks are really reflecting biological age, might be aging more slowly or more quickly. And what's been shown is that indeed, those individuals who tend to be off the line, depending on whether they seem to be aging more slowly or more quickly, are at lower or higher risk for specific diseases. So that adds some level of confidence that this epigenetic clock, chronological epigenetic aging clock, is actually reflecting biological age. And so the idea is maybe we can use that information to develop epigenetic clocks that will, that will in a predictive way, tell you how old you are biologically, right? So you can get tests now. There are plenty of companies now that are selling these things where you can go buy your epigenetic blood tests. Mostly this has been done in blood cells. That's one limitation to think about is almost all of the literature in humans is developed on epigenetic clocks from blood. And it's, and it's still, I think, a little bit of a question, you know, what if the, even if this is reflecting biological age, it's the biological age of your blood, which may or may not reflect the biological age of your entire body. Um, but you can buy tests now that based on your, you give them some of your blood, they will tell you your epigenetic biological age or some number. So they're, they're looking at uh, PBMC, I assume? I don't know, honestly. I'm not, I'm not involved in any of this stuff. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I don't, I don't know exactly what... Yes, most of the studies that have been published are, are PBMCs. I don't, I don't, I don't even, they may even have saliva tests now. I don't know, yeah. honestly, how these commercial companies are doing it. I mean, some of the clocks I've seen where I've just immediately discounted them is 
when some of their inputs are things like glucose level, vitamin D level, which are things that vary so much from day to day, and by the way, are so easy to manipulate. Like you yeah. can take a vitamin D supplement or not take a vitamin D supplement. You can you know, have a high cortisol spike one morning and your glucose is 110 versus have a good sleep the night before and your glucose is 95. So something that's that malleable, I just don't think makes sense as, a, as, a, as an ironclad uh, marker of, of true, you know, biologic age. Yeah. So uh, let me take a step back. So the epigenetic clocks, right, are, are probably the one that people talk about the most and have gotten the most traction in, in the field. And, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I guess I'm a little bit of a skeptic, but I mean, I believe these clocks, I believe the data and I believe that, um, that the correlations are extremely strong. I, you know, I'm a little bit worried still, uh, that there are so many data points in the epigenome that you can find a pattern that will fit anything you go looking for. And that, um, so I'm a little bit worried about the dimensionality of the data and, and whether or not, you know, it's, it's pattern matching in, in some cases, um, rather than, than it's really truly going to be a robust predictor of, of biological age. That probably reflects what is admittedly you know, my limited understanding of the mathematics behind a lot of the epigenetic clocks that have, that have been built. So I don't, I, I don't view that as a strong criticism. It's just a personal sort of concern that I, that I have. So you're basically saying without, without doing the, the, the complex mathematics to correct for so many, the multiple looks that you can take at the data, yeah. you could be tricked. And, and, I, and I, 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 I have not spent enough time looking at that either. Um, I would like to have Steve Horvath on the podcast at some point. Uh, because I think Steve could speak to that probably better than anyone yeah, else. Yeah, he's, he's the expert. Yeah, for sure. so so that's. But, but uh, the other the other point I wanted to make is what what you alluded to is now what people are doing is going beyond the epigenetic clocks to try to look at every possible thing you could measure. Sometimes combining that with the epigenetic right. clock to build these super clocks or multi clocks or multi omic clocks, right? And I think there's huge power in that. Um, but it also increases that dimensionality problem that I just mentioned, because, you know, all of a sudden now you've got, if you're doing omics stuff, you've got tens of thousands of additional data points that you can measure and you can fit a pattern where a lot of this, and I think, I think even Steve and other people who are in the epigenetic clock field would agree with this, where a lot of this has yet to really mature is in getting us to, to biological explanations for what the patterns are telling us, right? Mm -hmm. What genes are, are they that these, these marks are located at and are those in any way causal for, you know, biological aging? So I think if you get to the point where you can understand mechanism, it's going to be much more powerful. I also think though, this gets to the fundamental challenge with biomarkers. And I think this is where you're dissatisfied. Um, we have a lot of biomarkers of aging. We just don't have any validated biomarkers of aging, right? And it's, and it's, a, it's a real, this has been a problem, you know, since I was a graduate student. Um, everybody's wanted biomarkers of aging. The, the NIA had a huge program where they, they did all this funding to identify biomarkers of aging. I think it was back in the 80s, right, right. maybe, um, before my time, 90s maybe. Um, you can identify all sorts of things that correlate with age. How do you get to the point of convincing yourself first and other people second that these things are actually telling you something about biological aging that can then be used to understand whether an intervention is working, first of all, at the population level, but ultimately where we want to get to is at the individual level, right? So what we all want is a test that you can take and you can fast, you can do your fasting regimen, you can do your rapamycin, you can take metformin, whatever, and you can come back and find out, is it working from this set of biomarkers? And, and that's where we wanna to get to, and, and we're not there yet, I think everyone would agree. I'm not sure when we're gonna get there. Um, so who's the natural owner of getting there? Because you know, I had this discussion with Steve yeah. Osted recently, and, and he, he made the same point you did, which is, look, the NIA tried to do this a long time ago, and 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 tried, you know, validly, right? They put a lot of money into it. <clears throat> you could make the case that the technology simply wasn't mature enough to do this. 30, 30 years later, we have a lot more tools at our disposal, right? It's, it's yeah. you've, got, you've got the entire world of omics at your disposable, plus you've got machine learning, plus, plus, yeah. plus. Um, is there any reason this couldn't be done today? And if so, 
is this, this strikes me as a project that's almost too big for, for academics, right? Because it's too disjointed. But at the same time, it's not a particularly interesting um, commercial problem to solve because it's far too big an investment before you could get to why you would care about it, right? A commercial problem is give me a drug. Yeah. But I'm arguing you can't develop a drug really well without this. So who's like, there's a bit of a, a, a cart and a horse thing, which is someone's got to pony up a lot of money to develop the foundation of a pyramid that will ultimately become a great tool for drug discovery and um, a much more streamlined manner in which we could do clinical trials around this. Yeah. So, so I, think it, I think the answer to your question is it depends on whether you're talking about doing this preclinically or clinically, right? I actually think this is a Don't you think it has to be is, done both? Uh, well, eventually, yes. It's 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 a problem that can be solved today preclinically. Like there is no real barrier to doing what you just said. So multiomic analysis of aging in mice right. with interventions, applying machine learning to identify patterns that predict the effect of interventions and individual outcomes for longevity. You obviously have to think a little bit about, you know, what what can you measure? Um, if you want to do this longitudinally, right? You can't kill them, the animals, right? Uh, um, so you could you're sort of restricted to blood, but, but so there are some practical aspects. But there's no there's no technical barrier to to doing that now. Who should do it? Who might be doing it? Right? Um, I mean, I think this would fall maybe in the realm of what Calico could do. Right, they've got the resources, they've got the expertise. Is there any evidence that Calico is interested in this type of a problem? Um, I think so. I, I don't. I don't know. I don't honestly don't know anything about the inner workings of, of Calico these days. Um, I think conceptually they are interested in in multiomic signatures of different aging processes. I don't know if they've done this particular ex experiment. They certainly have the resources and expertise to do it. Um, they're not the only ones, but they're the first ones who come to mind, and they sort of fit this space between true academia and industry right yeah. where they're kind of the kind of this interesting beast in the middle um so i think it could be done preclinically, and you could actually then once you let's just say you have this test right you get to the end of day you say okay these are the most predictive i don't know whatever 24 things that that give you you know 95 percent confidence on remaining life right or whatever yep. whatever your endpoint is um, then you you get that test and then you show whether it works or not in an independent study. And if it does, I'd be pretty convinced, right? If you can show me that you create this test and then you go do a separate experiment and you can predict when the mice are six months old, how long they're going to live at an individual level, I'm impressed. And if you can show that this intervention, when you treat them, makes the signature go in the way that you think it should go and you can predict they're going to live 30% longer, I'm even more impressed. I'll believe it at that point. So that's not easy but I think it's doable. I think we know enough now and we've got enough things that we could measure that, that you, could certainly, you could certainly build the test and then whether it would work in the validation step or not, I don't know, but I, wouldn't, I, I, I think you could probably get it to work. Um, you can't take exactly that same approach to people. And right. this gets back to that, that, you know, the same issue that we talked about with clinical trials, right? It takes a long time to do the validation step and know that you have actually change somebody's biological state so that as they get older, they are at lower risk for disease and are likely to live some X percent longer. So you're almost obligated to have some level, you, you have to have some level of faith in the test at that point, right? And I don't know, it's gonna be different for everybody. And I honestly don't know what the regulatory step has to be, right? Before you could convince regulators that you can actually you know, go out and tell the general public that this test works. Although I will say there are already people doing that and the regulators aren't doing anything about it as far as I can tell. So, you know, there you are. This podcast is for general informational purposes only. and does not constitute the practice of medicine, nursing, or other professional healthcare services, including the giving of medical advice. No doctor-patient relationship is formed. The use of this information and the materials linked to this podcast is at the user's own risk. The content on this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Users should not disregard 
or delay in obtaining medical advice from any medical condition they have, and they should seek the assistance of their healthcare professionals for any such conditions. Finally, I take conflicts of interest very seriously. For all of my disclosures and the companies I invest in or advise, please visit peteratiamd.com forward slash about, where I keep an up-to-date and active list of such companies. 